Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy Geller, Director of MetalCon, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of MetalCon Live. Today, we bring you Role Forming Basics, presented by Tal Fiefenthal from Metacool Technologies and presented by the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association, also known as the FMA. Before Paul takes over, I'd like to remind you to mark your calendar for some upcoming events that I'm pretty sure you won't want to miss. On March 22nd, as part of our Future Leaders series, the Metal Construction Association will be presenting Decoding the Language of Metal Construction. This is a really great opportunity to learn from the best. Bob Zabzik, MCA's Technical Director, and Todd Miller of Isaiah Industries will be your presenters. Also, remember that MetalCon 2023 will take place from October 18th to 20th at the Las Vegas Convention Center. We can't wait, and it will be here before you know it. So you can go to metalcon.com now and book your hotel and sign up to receive early details. You can also follow us on social media, and I can also share with you that registration will officially open on April 3rd. So we're looking forward to that. Finally, if you need any technical help during this webinar, please reach out to MetalCon support in the chat box. And don't forget to complete the post-webinar survey to earn AIA learning units for today's session. That's all I have. And now I'm going to hand it off to you, Paul. Good afternoon. Am I live here? Yep. I'm good? You are good to go. OK, thank you. Um, First, I'll start out by introducing myself a little bit. My name is Paul Tiefenthal. I work for a company in Spring Lake, Michigan called MetaTool Technologies. Um, we are a tooling supplier. Um, primarily, our primary right now is to tier one automotive um, companies. But my history, um, going back 20 years, I spent uh, 20 years in the role forming as an OEM machine tool um, supplier to a lot of building trades, to a lot, and then um, in 2009, we shifted gears and I went to work for a tier one supplier in Grand Haven, Michigan, um, where I kind of shifted into the automotive world, um, a lot heavier and a lot more. Um, in the last year, I've shifted back more towards the tooling side of it, but more geared toward supplying for the tier one. So I have <clears throat> over 20 plus years experience in the field. Um, also have been a member of the role forming council for 20 some years and I'm a past chair of the Role Forming Council for the FMA. So we'll start my presentation here. Hopefully we get this going. So what we'll talk about today is um, basically the complex role forming systems. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of the different systems that we have um, how the component from the basic brought up to the very comp complex. There are some automotive trilogies here, but there's also a lot of building trade stuff in here as well. So we'll see. The first thing we're going to talk about is the machinery that you're going to see and the types of roll forming, um, blank cut, post cut, inline welding applications, and complete systems um, as we move along. So the, like I said, the first thing we're going to talk about today is, is different types of roll form machines that you'll see out there. Now, most of the equipment that I will be talking about here will be more towards, geared more towards um, production style equipment. And these aren't, won't be machines geared more towards rolling up to a job site and rolling gutter per se, or soffit or fascia on the job site. These are going to be for production facilities that are making large volumes of um, product. So the first thing we'll talk about is, is what we call the standard machine. Um, it has an inboard, let me see, it has an inboard, an inboard housing with an outboard housing. Um, usually the outboard housing then is removable and that's where the tooling that you see here will get installed in there on those two shafts. Um, they can be set up strategically equal geared or unequal geared depending on the depth or the type of section that you're gonna run. Um, this is the most common type of machine you'll see um, in the field or in there. 
Um, the advantage to this is uh, the stability and controlling and even pressure on the profile. So what I'm saying there is once we put our rolls on like here, we'll have adjustments inboard and outboard. We can control the pressure there. The disadvantage kind of to this style is you have to take this outboard off to install a different set of tooling. So it's the changeover is a little more intense on this style of machine. Um, I'll take that to the next level. We can do a rafted style machine. Um, so we would look at a standard machine um, and typically four to 10 heads on a raft plate so that that tooling would stay on. And then this entire plate would be interchanged on the roll form mill. So the mill would stay, this plate would come off and a new set of tooling would come on. So it looks similar to this. We've had some kind of um, coupling scenario where we can connect and disconnect that. Um, some of the, the advantages, like I said, the tooling will stay on the shafts for proper settings. You don't have to take it off and readjust. It's there. The disadvantage to that basically is the storage area that it's going to take up for these additional rafts. Um, and you will need a means to move them. This, this particular one we look at here, we, we can do it one of two ways. We can come in with a forklift and lift this off, or we have lifting rings. We can take it off with an overhead crane. So either way, now there's there's a couple different strategies around rafting a mill. Um, you could have multi, you could have a set of rafts for every set of tooling that you have for every individual cross section. You could have maybe two or three sets of rafts where you change that cross section out on the mill and bring that other, the, the set of rafts that's coming off to a staging area where they could be changed over offline. So you don't have as many dedicated sets, but you don't have the downtime on your roll form line in order to do a tooling changeover. The tooling changeover can be done in uh, maybe an hour versus multiple hours or across a shift. And then that changeover, those rafts could be pre-staged and changed over. So usually you have, two to three sets of rafts per mill in that scenario. So you have one ready to go at all times, you have one on the mill and you have one that you're changing over. So three is the optimal number if you're, if you're not gonna dedicate tooling to rafts in that scenario. Um, we have what we could call an overhung spindle machine. So there is no outboard housing or in this style looks like we've moved it in here with a spacer. So your tooling would now be put into this area here on the shaft. So what we call is overhung and there's no support on the outside. So you basically have a two point adjustment on the back side of the tooling on, on the gear side. So the advantage to this style is you can change the tooling out much quicker because you pull a bolt, screw or a nut depending on the manufacturer of the machine. Slide the tooling off, you don't have to pull an outboard off. Um, the disadvantage to this type of mill is it can be very easy to get out of adjustment because you don't have an adjustment on each side of the roll tooling. And it could be um, difficult to get everything balanced back out because you're not adjusting on each side of the rolls. So there is some drawbacks to this style. Um, it can be very difficult um, to keep in the adjustment range. A duplex machine is basically um, two overhung machines opposing each other. So if you have a panel um, like a door skin panel or a garage door panel or a roofing panel, where you have multiple widths of that panel and you have a form on each edge, like you can see here, we only have forms on both edges. So now we have the ability to move one head in and out or both heads in and out in order to accommodate different width panels. There's a couple different variations on a duplex today. This is an overhung style. They do have a through shaft style. It has a telescoping shaft where your tooling is on, on that all the time. Um, this, this is a hemming machine. This would be this particular machine here was a powered hemming machine. It was on a, I believe it was like a W Valley um, product. So this one in front of the roll form line where we basically could run with or without a hem for that particular product line. So both heads were adjustable in and out. Um, the advantage of this um, obviously is the quick changeover for multiple widths and sections. Um, the disadvantage, again, you 
kind of have the same scenario you had with the overhung. It can be difficult to adjust roll pressures or get set. They're typically dedicated, so it's not as, as critical there in that changeover when you're doing a duplex. Um, cause, because they're, the tooling changeover is so difficult, um, they are typically dedicated pieces of equipment, so they're going to run one product line. So if you can imagine trying to climb down inside this machine in order to change tooling out, that's why they're difficult for the changeover because now you're passing, you can't even bring the tools up to it. You're going to have to pass them in. Doing a tooling change be, can become very difficult in this scenario going the right way. So this machine is very small. The tools come on and off pretty quickly. Um, very easy to manage that part of it. We'll talk about blank fed um, roll forming a little bit. So we talk about post cut blank fed. So blank fed means we're going to take a, a product and we're going to um, feed that product through the mill. It's, it's basically the simplest kind of system used a lot in office furniture where we have one piece flow, um, not typically used where I'm at today. Um, not a lot used, was not a lot used in the building trade stuff that we've done, but it is an option. Um, it's the simplest system, um, consists of an operator manually feeding a pre-cut blank into a roll into the machine and the finished product comes out the other end. It can drop into a bin basket or uh, exit conveyor, that type of stuff. This particular machine here that we see has is a drawer body machine. So it runs office furniture drawer panels, side panels, probably side back side panels. Um, so there was two different widths of that panel or two different configurations based on the box drawer or the, or the file drawer. And we could actually run both products down both sides of this as needed on the on the assembly line. So along with that pre-cut, you can automate this. So we'll talk about some of the automation that may go with that pre-cut. We'll use a D-stack machine. So we now can load blanks into this, onto the skid into this. Uh, the blanks will get picked up, dropped on a conveyor belt, and then fed into the roll form. So now you've automated that from a hand feed to an automatic feed. Um, so we can also use an inline blanking press, same. Uh, with this system, we have a small programmable feeder. And as you can see, we only have a couple different features, probably a crossover and a hole pattern. But we can, we can produce this longer part uh, based on a feed programmable feed pattern, and we can pick up different variations of hole pattern along different given parts. So bringing up a menu that can give me different part links, it can give me different hole patterns within those part links all on the feed program. So we typically, we would like to use a conveyor system to come in. You're going to need a um, really good guiding system to bring that in, the loose brank. Uh, this particular scenario, if my memory serves me right, we, we had a slight magnetic conveyor and we can't see it here. Well, you don't see a very good picture of it there, but there's a guide system to help bring that in to the roll former square because that's going to be critical. We do have a question, Paul, whenever you're ready. Okay, so I know you. we talked, I would see you, but I can't see you when I'm presenting. So <laughs> if you have a question, yes, this would be a good okay. question. Don't worry, I'm happy to do that. So we actually have one person who's asked two different questions. Is sure. there an amount of parts or footage that you need to run per year to start using these types of machines compared to on-site roll formers? Um, typically these, you're gonna be a million parts plus, or, you know, depend depends on, you know, it's volume over the length of the part. So it, it yes, there is, you have to do a ROI on, what that what that is. Um, these machines typically are going to last a lot longer, so you're going to put a lot more volume. We'd we'll, we'll be looking at a million plus parts a year, probably, or hundreds of thousands of parts to ship them out. Um, and these are these types of mills are production warranted mills, so the the cost of these mills will be quite a bit more. So you have to do the ROI based on what your flexibility is. 
on your par links. I mean, can you have standard par links? Can you run them in volume ahead of time and ship them to the job site? Or as you get to the job site, you measure and cut what you need and run them. So there's there's a lot more things to consider than just pure volume when it comes to this. These are what I'm talking about here are mostly production style machines. So you're going to want volume or families of parts that have a great deal of volume to run through a million, like I said, a million plus feet probably a year to justify that. But it, it, again, it depends on depends on your trucking costs, where you're shipping and your ROI on that. So there, there's a few variables into that. Awesome, perfect answer. There is one more question in that same comment, and it is, can you run this start stop like on-site machines or do these machines run continuously with no stopping? Um, yes, you can run start. It's, it, that's in all, all in how the lines are configured, right? And how the, how the OEM um, quotes it or how the customer would like it. So I have done both. I have done start stop lines. Um, and I have done continuous feed lines uh, for the automotive end of it here and for the building trade stuff was mostly all continuous feed feed lines um, at higher speeds for bigger volumes. But definitely any of this equipment can be sized and the controls can be done in such a manner that you would stop feed, you know, roll, stop, cut, roll, stop, cut. It, it, it's all in how the line is configured um, at the quoting process or at the build process. Wonderful. And since we've actually started this question, another one has come through asking, are duplex machines offered in mobile versions, truck or trailer mounted as well? Um, I'm not that familiar with that industry. You would have to reach out to one of the OEMs that manufacture that type of equipment. I would think that there's probably some type of a version of it, yes, that would be truck, truck mounted. Um, but like I said, that's I, I don't have the answer to that. But I would think that that there are something made on that variable type machine that could be done in the field. Yes, I would say that's probably um, a doable thing. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's all the questions we have right now. That's all we have? Okay. For the That's moment. Good. So twice to remember when we're doing when we're doing blank fed um, roll forming. Um, and even this, I mean, even the, in the field, you can have blank fed machines. You just start it up and feed a blank. So these part links must be at least one and a half times the horizontal distance of the spindle. We like two to three as a max, but a minimum of one and a half. So the reason for that is you have to have that part in at least two stations in order to keep it guiding through the mill, or there has to be some other um, ways to guide that in between passes to keep it going. But you wanna have the drive of at least two stations to keep you moving through. And again, like I talked about earlier, we're gonna to want to have um, a very good entry guide in that um, keeps, the, keeps the product square in the first pass. Um, if it's not square going into the first pass, it's gonna get worse as it carries through the roll former as it goes th down. A lot of times I like if I'm doing a blank fed part, I'll like to have a flat pass, meaning no forming in that first pass, just to help keep it square and get it going into the mill um, very well. So these were these are good. The, uh, some of the other points to remember, straightening can be difficult. So it's gonna be critical on your roll tooling design that you have a very straight part or as straight as you can coming out. Um, We've done things like put straighteners between, if the part's long enough, we can put straighteners between the last two passes to try to manipulate that up and down bow or side bow. Um, back when I was young, which was a long time ago now, it seems like, uh, we would rely on one part to push the next part out of the straightener block. So we'd have a block even on the exit end and the part coming through the roll former would push that out. Um, problem with that is you get nicks or marks or things from one part hitting the next part to push it out. And as as the process has evolved over the years, um, that's not a very desirable type of thing. So we've looked at other options to be able to do that. A lot of that is between passes in order to get that straight coming out the exit end of the machine. So there's other, other things um, 
some of these little, this is like a little three roll straightener in here. This is a pneumatic offset feature. So there was parts within this particular section that had a certain feature. So pneumatically, we could engage this little set of rolls right here that would take care of put that extra feature in um, on the fly within the tooling. So no questions. So we'll go into post-cut application. So you can see here, this is like a drip edge line. You can see a small, what looks like to me, a little L channel of drip edge. And it, we'll talk about post-cut. This is where we're gonna put the cutoff at the exit end. Um, so we're gonna use a cutoff at the exit end. We'll talk about the types of straighteners we can now use because we're not relied in between passes. Um, some of the different types of cutoff dies that we have in that post-cut application. Um, presses, types of presses that are typically used and um, we'll touch on link control systems. And I believe a lot of these, some of the link control systems that we use were, are geared towards some of those mobile units as well. So first thing we'll talk about is straightener. So we're gonna roll it off of a coil now. And now we have the ability to strain that after the roll tooling. So we're gonna roll the section. We'll have the ability to straighten that coming out the exit end of the mill. And typically we like to have five, five planes of adjustment or, or five ways or planes of adjustment to affect straightness of the part. So in this particular, this is a pretty small straightener. It's very small. This is a, like a little trim section. And I spent a lot of years, I don't, I think it was a wood trim. So we can adjust the twist here with this axial movement. There's a pivot point back here. So this whole front plane would pivot up and down. We can go up and down and in and out. So we have our adjustment. So now we can try to affect the straightness of the part. So if it's not very straight coming out, especially in a long piece, we have the ability through this unit to be able to adjust that straightness of the part. We have roller type straighteners where we got a couple different styles here. Basically, this is a soffit panel. Um, really, we had just up and down on this. So we used a, a dual roller top and bottom in place of a block. And we would then just raise and lower that to get the flatness and the straightness of the part. We could pinch it a little bit because we found that sometimes if we pinch these um, hems on the soffit, it would help our straightness depending on the material. Um, and the louvering that's in it. This one is a is a roller box type straightener. Um, so this would be more like on a closed section where we can contain it on all four sides. Um, we can we can put the twist in here. We can go up and down and in and out with that with that roller type straightener. Now we also built these so we have some adjustment on these rolls so we can affect certain positions and parts on that with by adjusting the rolls. This particular one is cartridge style, so you don't really have any adjustment on those internal rolls. Um, but we have found that there are certain applications where we can adjust these internal rolls and increase and decrease pressure, which do affect the straightness as well. I don't like doing that. I would rather get the profile correct coming out of the mill and all I'm doing is affecting straightness a little bit, but some in some profiles and some scenarios, that's just kind of how it is. It's just kind of the life. So kind of in our automotive world, I don't know how much it applies, carries over to the building. We have a lot of sweeps and parts and some of the stuff I see today, maybe there's more application for it out there um, in certain things. So, so what we do, these are window guides and we'll sweep down this, this, this particular unit up in the corner here is a bumper sweep unit. So um, my history right now is with in the last immediate um, past is, with uh, high energy impact, high impact tooling, ultra high strength materials. So we sweep bumper beams. So the bumper beam within your car would be swept in a unit similar to this. Um, these are like window guide sections. So, um, so the inside your door, you have a window guide that the guy that the window would ride up and down in. And that's what these were. So they come off the roll former and we'll sweep them sideways. Well, actually you can see this one has a little twist. It may have some up or down bow depending on what's needed for that particular application. Um, and you can see it, this was particular one here is a five block unit. 
uh, one, two, three on this side, two on that side. You can see the sweep um, can be done with three. Um, if it's a slight sweep, we've done it with just a single block. So sometimes it's advantageous to have a little up or down bow depending on the install. So I've seen soffits where we want a little bit maybe down bow so that push it up into the into the soffit channel so it so it installs. And there are certain reasons that you would want to have some sweep in particular direction. Um, and, and a lot of times if it's very slight, that can be just done with a, a standard straightener. Um, maybe you don't have to get very complicated with it. We'll talk about some of the types of different types of cutoff dies that follow into this application as well. <clears throat> the first one we'll talk about is pretty common. It's a slugless cutoff die. Um, it would be um, what you typically see in a lot of in a lot of uh, metal trade type machines, uh, building trade type machines. So basically you have two, two matched die steels that scissor against each other and just cut the part off. Um, they're very good for, there's no slug, there's no scrap. Um, the critical thing obviously is timing the uh, moving blade to the stationary blade to make sure you don't deform the ends of the part. Uh, good for high speed application because they're very repeatable. Um, they're typically not a lot of maintenance in these types of dies. Uh, if you keep them sharpened, and even if you're cutting like gauge aluminum, they don't even have to be sharpened that often. In fact, we've had them come back to us in years past, and they we'd say, well, when's the last time you sharpened it? <laughs> the, the person would say, sharpen it, what's that? So they could run a long time between sharpings. It's short travel distance, so we'll talk about presses. They're very repeatable and short travel distance, so they, they apply themselves very well to a high speed application. So the other type is a slug type cutoff. Well, one or the other. So this would use a blade now to come through the part and, and separate the two parts. Um, so now you're gonna have a slug, so you will have off all or scrap. Holes and notches can be added on the ends of parts with this type. And this would probably be the type of thing where you'd want to see a start and stop maybe because you're going to run it out and you're going to cut it off and you're going to pierce some holes maybe in the end of the part or at given intervals. So you may want to do that start, start and stop application and something like this. Um, we can add forms and shear forms and that type of things at the ends of the parts or within the part, depending on the length of the die. Again, if you're going to do a start and stop application, your die can be longer or heavier than if you're not and you, you're going to try to fly this die, meaning that it's going to travel at line speed. Um, now, typically, as opposed to a slugless die, this is going to require more maintenance, sharpening, um, blade maintenance, obviously. The blade's going to take a, a real beating in this type of application, so you're going to want to have spares on blades and steels and that type of thing that you probably wouldn't need with a slugless die as much anyway. So we'll talk we, about... <clears throat> we do have question? a question. Yep. Sure. We have a couple of formers that are having issues with their cutoff dies slugless. It seems sure. like the topping might be off and results in some issues. What are some ways that they can correct these issues? So if the timing's off, you're gonna get a deformation on the end of the part. Um, typically what I, you, you want that cut to try to finish up at the, same, at the same time all the way around, which means depending on the angle, of the cut, you may have to delay certain areas within that mover blade in order to make that cut finish. So your mover blade is gonna cut on the top half of that cutout. So typically what we would do in the CAD here, what we do in the CAD here is we, we will make that model and we'll move it over and we'll look at the cutoff, what we call the timing. So you're gonna make sure that that cut finishes up at the same time. So so one area, depending on the angles, will have to start prior to another area. And then that area in that blade can be delayed so that they actually finish in the same, same scenario. Now, if you have like a 90 degree part, you're cutting it on a 45, everything's gonna finish perfectly. 
if you've got a 90 degree part and you're cutting straight down and it's it's parallel, it's going to finish perfectly. It should cut very good. If you have deformation, you probably have a clearance issue. If you have a non-symmetrical, non-45 part, you're cutting it on a 60, that's where you really have to look at. I mean, the, in the old days, we would actually just maybe even take the mover side top and trace that out on paper and the bottom, and then we just start sliding the paper cutouts around to see where that timing issue is. Today's day, we can do that in the CAD much easier if we have the CAD for that. But if it's a truly a timing issue, you're gonna to wanna to move that mover steel against the stationary steel and see where that cut finishes up. That's gonna be the only way to uh, determine if it's real a timing issue. That's it. Is there Perfect. any more questions? Good. Okay. So far, not yet. Okay, so we'll talk about cutoffs, um, types of presses. So there's, uh, there's a few different types of ways to cut off or press types we're gonna talk about. First of all, we'll talk about mechanical presses. Um, it's usually a crank style flywheel can be over, crank can be over or under. So an OBI here with the, with the flywheel and the crank above, these are underdrive presses with a, where the crank is actually below and we draw these top halves down. Um, they're gonna be consistent tonnage through the stroke. Um, some of the presses today are a lot faster than they were even 10 or 15, 20 years ago. So these presses, um, typically strokes per minute aren't, if you're getting the used press market, you're not gonna find that for high speeds. So if you're doing a start and stop application, this could be a perfect press for that. Um, most part, they're relatively quiet. Um, they're not conductive to an open loop encoder system. So this is where we get into some of the link controls. So the open loop encoder system assumes that everything from the encoder wheel downstream is consistent. And we know from history that typically any type of mechanical press with a flywheel doesn't always stop at top in the exact same position. So position, whether it's above top center or behind top center, results in time, time into the stroke, results in length variation in an open loop system. So we don't really typically like to use those with an encoder unless we have some type of gripper that we grip the part with and lock it in place, which brings us to air, air presses. And so there's two typically styles of air presses. Now there can be some variations um, with air cylinders and different types of things, but if you're talking true presses, there's kind of two different styles of an air press. So this, this one here has a big rubber bladder in between this mover plant and this upper plant. So when we hit that with a signal, that bladder expands and drives this plant down. This one has a piston. So as you can see, the round piston in here, much like an air cylinder. So there's a big steel plate bolted onto the top of this mover piece here. And again, we have a big three-way poppet valve up here when we fire the signal from an encoder or whatever signal we get to fire that press, we then drive that, we drive this plant down as well. So air presses, bladder style or piston style, uh, they're good, they're very fast, great for high speed applications. Uh, actually, you marry them up with a slugless cutoff die. Um, it's a very good application because you can limit the stroke and very small stroke, they're very, and they can be very fast and very repeatable. So the stroke position, the upper stroke position should be very consistent. So the open loop type cutoff with an encoder is gonna let you run um, high speeds and we get repeatable downstream from that. So from when, from when I give a press fire signal, that start position is always the same. The time to the cut is always the same. So we should be fairly consistent on, on our link. Um, like I said, short press strokes, uh, low maintenance. There's not a lot of, uh, we'll talk about this too. There's not a lot of maintenance if they're set up correctly. The, the big drawbacks here is they're typically very noisy. The impact shock and vibration can be difficult to dampen. Um, it does not really have a consistent bottom stroke if you're trying to do a form or a shear form or anything that relies on that press to close up consistently. So it can bounce on the bottoms. 
And depending on uh, the air bladder versus the piston, you can have some drop off in tonnage through the stroke. So the biggest problem with them is the impact vibration and the noise. Um, from what we see is usually, typically we set them up and, and for me, the application would always be um, oversize the press so that we can, we can set it with control so we're not pushing the limits of the air press and then we can get the timing and everything set so there's not as much noise or there's not as much impact. But <clears throat> the problem that we usually typically see is something's not working correctly. The first thing everybody wants to do is turn up the air pressure or increase the timing. And then pretty soon it's banging very hard. It's difficult. We tear up floors, um, break cement. Uh, people that put it on the machine since unwanted vibrations into their roll former hard on the roll tooling, hard on everything. So that is definitely, it's more geared for me towards a very light duty application where you need speed and stroke and not big tonnages over 20 tons or anything like that. I don't typically recommend it. Can be if it's set up correctly. We'll get into hydraulic and this it kind of hydraulic or pneumatic, but mostly hydraulic is what we'll talk about here. But we can do the same thing pneumatically on a low tonnage. So the hydraulic would come into a higher tonnage type piston. So we can do a slugless cutoff die with a hydraulic cylinder here to fire that scenario. So there's no press per se. Um, this has a moving platen. So the die, the whole press basically moves and we fire the hydraulic cylinder down on top. And this was a pre-pierce application, same type of thing where we fire a, with a hydraulic cylinder. These are all self-contained units. You can see the, uh, the pump unit with air cool here and here. Um, there's another one, actually that's this one back in, in, the, in the front end of it. So it goes, goes within that line. So they're self-contained, they can be self-contained or if, you're, if your facility has the ability to have its own um, cooling system and, and infrastructure, then you don't have to have the cooling that we have typically on these. You'll go through a cooling tower and the, and the pump units um, will be smaller than, than what we show here and the controls will be smaller as well. So <clears throat> hydraulic piston types are, they can be fast, good for high speed applications, same as the air press, basically the same principle. Um, accurate top stroke, same as the air press. Uh, so they're good for open loop measuring systems. Um, short press strokes, again, are possible. Um, and longer press strokes are possible. So they're much more versatile. Um, not a lot of maintenance. Again, it's kind of the same. Um, the noise is a lot less because you don't have that unleashed air control. You can control the hydraulic motion a little bit better. So the impact and shot vibrations is considerably less than that of an air press. Um, does have a consistent bottom stroke, mostly for embossing. It depends how how accurate you need to be in that scenario. Uh, can take a little more floor space because now you have a control unit, uh, the power unit, and the valving, and that type of thing. That's going to take up a bigger footprint typically than like an air press doesn't have a very large footprint at all. We'll hold a consistent stroke through the tonnage. Through, the, through this consistent tonnage through the stroke, I'm sorry. So um, many applications that we use hydraulics um, for us here, we use hydraulics for a lot of um, different applications. Our cutoffs are, are all basically hydraulic type cutoffs at this point in, the, in this world. So if you're gonna use air presses or even mechanical presses or hydraulic presses, you're gonna want a base and you're gonna at least want two axes of adjustment. So you're gonna at least at a minimum want up and down and in and out so that you can adjust the part to the profile coming out of the roll former. Um, you don't wanna be affecting the straightness of the part with the cutoff press if you don't have to. You're ideally, you would like to match that cutoff up to the part that's presented to it from the roll former. Um, so if we're doing some sweat parts or some other fancy type parts that, that carry on, um, we want more axis of adjustment to match that part up to what's coming off the roll former. 
So in this scenario, it's an air. In this scenario, it's an air press. We have multiple axes of adjustment up, down. We have a twist, and we can pivot. This is a mechanical Tishkin type mechanical press where we can actually pivot in those same axes. So we have a pivot here on the center, there, up and down, and in and out. So we have multiple axes there as well in order to um, to match that die orientation up to the part coming off the roll former so our presentation is correct. So we'll go back and talk about a few different, a couple different types of um, positive of link control systems. We'll talk about positive link control systems and there's still applications out there for this. Um, there's a lot more on the, on the digital side or on the electronic side now than there, than there used to be. So um, these are typically around cams and the locks and round blade style dies where they can be on uh, slugless dies as well. So this, this scenario here with this cutoff die, we have two small fingers that are gonna come in and engage the part. Once they find the notch that they're gonna ride in, then this part, then this die would travel forward, tripping a press, making the cut. Um, so this, this is a pre-pierce trigger. So kind of the same scenario, we have a pin. It's gonna drop into a hole, which is then gonna fly the die and make the cut. Um, then the air cylinder would pull that pin out. In this scenario, the, the blade or air cylinders would cam these back and there's a spring loaded catch that would hold it back till the die returns to home position. This isn't a very good picture to the right here of, uh, it's a mechanical um, type of cutoff length control. So my part's gonna come out of the cutoff press, which is back here. It's gonna come up and it's gonna hit a flag trip and then that whole assembly then will travel, cycling the press and make a cut and you have it locked. It's, it's very good for, uh, Link control, you have very accurate link control systems, um, but the part has to be strong enough to carry the die. Um, again, with any of these type of scenarios, um, if your die is heavy or the part is very weak, you have the option to have a disformed hole or a tear or something like that. Um, because we are actually picking up the die in a pre-punched hole, we're gonna carry the weight of that die through the press to fire. Um, we're gonna talk about open loop system. So I've already talked about open loop off of an encoder. So typically in a lot of the uh, metal building trades, we're gonna run an open loop encoder. So we're gonna measure the length of the part that's going through the roll former. Uh, so, the, so again, like I said, that it, we're gonna assume that once we get to a preset point, everything downstream is accurate and repeatable. So, the, so any variation in that repeatability, the faster you run, the more length variation you have. So if you're running at 15 feet a minute, maybe that length variation gives you 10 thousandths. And you increase that to 100 feet a minute, that length variation would accelerate, would go to 15 or 20 thousandths and vice versa as you went up in speed. So the time that that length variation is would relate to length deviation. And again, like we talked about, we don't have anything picking up on the part or anything that's going to affect that part. So we don't worry about a hole pickup or a tear in the part as it goes. So the, and then that goes into a closed loop situ situation now where we're going to run the encoder. Probably two, we're going to look at the line speed we're gonna look at the amount of material passing through. So we're gonna hit a, a point where then we're gonna engage a servo and we're gonna move that die with the servo and match it up. So basically electronically, we're gonna lock it in like we did in a positive link control system. So now we've hit that, we're gonna move it up, it's gonna match the speed and we're gonna make the cut. So this, this is gonna pick up the speed it's going to match the speed of the roll form, or we're going to make the cut, and it's going to come back to the home position and wait again. So we were looking at different positions of, of that cutoff in the servo there to make sure we get up to speed. So we have what we say is a closed loop, so we close that loop back too. So now we've closed that loop right around the part, and we don't have an open. We took all the open variation out of it. It can be very accurate in the length control. Even at higher speeds, it can be very accurate. We'll talk a little bit about a couple, three applications for inline welding, probably the most, the most um, 
used applications for us. And I don't know if this will really play into the metal con. I probably could have pulled this section out, but I left it just in case people are curious. So we, we can do, um, there's actually a fourth one, but the MIG is, is not as uh, well used as uh, the rotary seam induction and laser at this point. The laser is tends to be where everything's going at this point more in the application process. So inline um, rotary spot or rotary resistance. So we can, it's basically a rotary spot. So we're gonna bring this around we're gonna spot weld at, interview, at inter, any given intervals on the part. Um, so we're closing up in this case, a, um, a lobed beam or spot weld in the valley. We're gonna close that part up. And then you have a very rigid part coming out the end. In this case, it's a bumper. In this case, it gets swept. So we were sweeping high strength bumper material. Um, so the rotary speed is going to give you very much just like you would with a spot welder. You can see the tight pattern here. You're going to see the nugget that looks very similar to this. It's going to look just like a spot. What is a spot weld? So it's going to it's going to give you a very good welded cross section there. So the induction. So now in the induction weld, what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to form this part up and then we're going to super, we're going to superheat it either IE through a contact here or an induction coil like this. So we're going to heat that up to the, those edges of the material are molten hot. And then we're going to go through a squeeze box or a weld box similar to this. And we're just going to jam that material together and that's going to give us that induction process. So now we've welded those two surfaces together. Uh, like here, you can see these are welded together. You have your expulsion coming out the top and on the inside of the tube as well. So we can do it through a coil. Like I said, you have induction coil and the impeter, and we're going to run it through and we're going to push it together. Your weld's going to look very similar to this. Um, this one's been scarfed off the top. So we do an inline scarfing process. Um, to take that scarf off the top. You can do an internal scarfing process. It's, it's difficult to maintain. It's, it's uh, difficult to get rid of the scarf on the inside, but the external, again, it can be difficult to get rid of that scarf as well. It's very sharp. It's, it's a handling issue. Um, we have coilers. We have certain things here, choppers or breakers that we get rid of that expulsion. And laser. So a lot of what we do now is, is leaning away from induction, more towards laser, away from spot, more towards laser. Um, the nice thing about the laser is it doesn't really have a lot of um, limitations as far as material goes. So the three basic parts, you got a beam generator, a delivery system, and focus optics. So you know, you've got lenses. So we're gonna, we're gonna run fiber core, we're gonna generate the beam, we're gonna focus it with the lens, we're gonna bring it right in and concentrate it into a given area to make that induction weld. So we have different types of applications that we do. We can butt weld with a laser. So we can bring that tube up much like an induction, push them together. You don't really have to push them together. You bring them up and present them and then you laser weld down that seam. If we have this type of scenario. We can laser weld in that in that joint, so we can shoot our laser down that joint and, and join those two parts, or we can do a lap. So we have an over under, and we just go ahead and lap seam weld that there. And this is going to be what your cross section of your laser weld would look like at this point. So we'll talk about systems. Um, so we live pretty much in a, in a modern world today and we expect, <laughs> expect their products with as, with as few people as possible, no secondary operations and it somewhat has to be idiot proof. So the result on um, the roll form line will become more complex to give them finished products and parts off the end. Along with the roll former cutoff systems, you want to add auxiliary equipment in order to achieve totally finished product. This can be done by adding the following. We don't want coil reels powered if not using stock straightener, not powered if using a stock straightener. Um, so we're either gonna pull it off with a straightener or we're gonna feed it off with a powered. Um, so if you're using a feeder, that's when you're gonna to wanna to do this. So you, you wanna not have your uh, programmable type servo feed pulling that off of a coil reel. 
Um, pre notch presses with multiple gags, and we talked about it. If you look at uh, this dot here, we have four, we have five different operations that we can program those features into the part in that press. Uh, with a loop, with a servo feeder, we can do that. Uh, loop control systems between the pre notch and the roll former. So now we're going to control the loop. So as the roll former takes up, we're going to control that loop going in. So we may need post punching. Um, we could partially form the section, notch and cut off, then finish form. So it's typically done if the notching is in an area where we have a lot of stretch or distort, um, if we try to do it in the flat blank. So we may want to form partially form that profile up and then put those notches in and then finish form it where they're not going to get stored or stretched through that process any further. So as you can see this line here, we have a, a small roll former and then two presses where we're putting some features in, another roll former and then a third press where we're putting more features in and the final roll former and then a, a small air press to cut it off. So basically your cutoff is just doing that um, cutoff. This one, we, we only have a few passes here, but what we actually did here is put some features in, some end features once we got it started and actually cut it off right here and then then we finished running that blank through the remaining roll former and it was straight and head tight line. There are many other options uh, that can be put into the line. Um, we can do rotary punching, uh, lance rolls, par labeling, adhesives and magnet strips. So you can see here, this is a soffit panel with an air vent louver. This is a starter strip, I believe it was, that has a, a pull through rotary punch. Now these rotary punches can be pull through um, if the product line allows it, they can be geared and anti-backlash. So we can actually mat, make punches and buttons up and put a given hole pattern as long as it repeats down the length of the part in there. These pull through ones are okay for like nail hole slots and, and small things that are repeatable through the part but aren't critical in size and location. So downstream after the cut. So if we're, if we're looking back maybe at a pre-cut application, going to run it out and we're going to go into this, maybe a secondary notching system here you've got a, a press where we're going to we're going to notch something after it's been rolled so you de-stack you got a small notcher here and then you're going to go into riveting staking and wing bending so these are lateral file cabinets and furnace casings so we're going to come off the roll former into either a punch or a bending operation and we're going to get like a finished cabinet or casing off the exit end of that mill. So we get that finished product still coming off the mill all in one single piece flow. So with the advantages in feeder controls, programmable controls, user interfaces, operators can make changes in line in minutes before tooling and vendor ships complete system, all parts should be programmed and run off on their floor. Due to the material conditions, adjustments may have to be made with little training, operators can make some of the following adjustments very easy. Line speed, length, hole pattern, strainness, and profile adjustments. As we have seen, most systems can be as simple as just a roll form machine with an operator feeding a blank part or machines with punching and mid-punching cutoff presses, secondary op operations, and automated central control operations. And servos on pads, servos on strainers, all that stuff can be done from a central controller today. Uh, unfortunately, probably the biggest limitation on the roll form system is the money that companies are willing to spend or what your ROI is on these systems. So some of the better ideas that um, we quote or get going get pared down when it comes to the cost of the machine because a company, the ROI isn't there to spend the type of money it would take for that length of automation. And that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Is there any questions? No, we do not have any further questions, but I am going to start doing your outro. If there are any okay. additional questions that come in between now and then, I will absolutely read them out to you. So first off, I want to say a huge thank you to Paul Tiefenthal. Paul, thank you so much for being here with us. A second huge thank you to the FMA for sponsoring this presentation, not sponsoring, but presenting this presentation with us. We so appreciate their involvement with MetalCon. We hope you'll come by. They are doing two workshops at MetalCon this year. Make sure you check by, uh, especially when the registration opens to find out more about those. Also, I wanna thank everyone who is still here with us now and everyone who viewed this both live in person and who will be viewing it in the future. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. 
Immediately following this, you will be receiving a survey link. Again, that survey link is not a requirement to receive your AIA credit. If you want the credit without filling out that survey, please just email me. I'm Kaylin. You can email Kaylin at metalcon.com. We are more than happy to hopefully see you guys at our future FMA partnership Metalcon Lives. We have two more coming up later this year, so check back for those. And again, a huge thank you to Paul and to the FMA. I don't have any further questions for you, Paul, but thanks everyone for joining us. We hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.